I spent some time at the end of last week going through some of the headlines in the newspaper to when I found something that not only caught my attention, but to be honest, it completely horrified me. Something that is very, very special to Irish people and precious had pla was plastered all over social media, over the radio and across different news headlines as well. So something that helped me at times get through tough days in college had increased in price. Over the course of four years, the price of a hot chicken filler roll had gone from two to seven euro. And this made national headlines in Ireland. Now, joking aside, this is something that's impacting all of us at the moment, where we're feeling a little bit of a squeeze as we see the price of things increase on a regular basis and the cost of inflation being a big factor for both customers, but for businesses as well. So today, I'm gonna to talk to you about the end of globalization, some of the silver linings that come with that, and then finish up by answering the one question that I guess get asked all of the time by customers is what's the one thing that my business can do to succeed internationally? Now, over the last couple of years, we've gone through some serious instability. There was a recovery of, from the recession of 2020-20 that moved into a period of rapid growth as a result of COVID. And those businesses who were starting to feel that they were getting back to some semblance of normality have now been faced with multiple, even more difficult challenges than they could have expected. So if we look at the terrible events that are happening in Russia with the invasion of Ukraine, this is creating a huge amount of an economic impact as well as obviously the terrible events that are going on. But we're seeing the cost of things like oil um, moving up rapidly, which is one of the results of the sanctions on Russia's exports. So we've all seen the, the videos of people queuing up for petrol at the local petrol station as well and panicking during that. But another big element that we're seeing the, the increase in price of here is wheat. So Russia and Ukraine actually account for 30% of the world's total wheat export market. So things like food are increasing for both businesses and for consumers as well. If we pair that with what's going on in the UK at the moment as well, where they're trying to deal with the cost of inflation here, as well as fighting the ongoing battle, which is life after Brexit, we're still involved in negotiations with, uh, with different countries and seeing a clear decline in trade, particularly with the EU. It's creating a, a difficult situation for businesses to thrive during that. Although we are seeing some positives, uh, recently there was a free trade agreement that was uh, agreed with Australia and there's work going on in the background as well to try and create more of those free trade agreements with those regions in particular a little bit uh, further outside of the EU that we're used to working with. This combined with the zero COVID policy that's going on in China is creating this elongated disruption to all supply chains as well, which again is putting pressure on businesses when they're trying to get products or services out to their customers. They're seeing this surge in prices of shipping, of warehousing, but also losing out on a huge amount of business because they simply can't provide for their customers or else they're experiencing extremely long delays as well. So in the short term, we're seeing these increased prices. We're seeing a lack of satisfaction because, and from a personal perspective, I ordered a bike in October, still hasn't arrived. It's going through, so it's really impacting how businesses actually have to communicate and work with their customers, but also be able to find the right type of customers within that. But in the long term, I think that this is going to make a profound change and it's going to force a revamp to the global supply chain. I think that we're going to see more regional manufacturing hubs and the increased adoption of things like automation, which in the longer term is going to create a much more flexible, resilient supply chain. But because of the proximity and if we look at regional hubs instead of global hubs, it's going to reduce lead times and as a result also bring prices back down, both for businesses and hopefully for customers as well, if we're lucky. But all of that together as well is forcing this increase in inflation. So more than half of the world's countries are experiencing about a 5% inflation rate at the moment, with the UK struggling 
probably a little bit the most out of all of the G7 countries where it's creeping a little bit closer to about 10% and is expected to be still the highest within the G7 over the, the next two to three years. So with this rise in cost of living, there's a profound impact on purchasing power for customers. And as a result, again, a big risk for companies who are trying to retain, but also to win new customers during that period. So the rise in cost of living is gonna impact our purchasing power, and also as a result, have a negative impact on consumer confidence as a result of that. So consumers are gonna become a little bit more precious about where they buy, where they look to buy as well. Um, but what we will also see within that is um, businesses becoming more cautious about the, the work that they're doing. So investing maybe a little bit less in the likes of marketing um, to try and focus on this. But one of the questions is, is this the end of globalization? Or is it the fundamental reset of what we've taken for granted over the last couple of years when we think of global trade and how simple it has been to work across borders, where I think that we're gonna to move to a culture where countries work with each other based on values as opposed to based on geographies. So for example, Scotland, New Zealand, and Iceland, probably three of the most geographically diverse and distant countries you can think of, a couple of years ago actually signed a governance model where they're working on well-being and uh, well-being ecology, where they're trying to invest in human well-being as well as well-being of the country so that they can actually grow the economy in that way. So three completely different countries coming together based on a set of core values. And for when customers are becoming a little bit more price conscious and a little bit more conscious of where they shop and who they shop from, I think we're gonna see something similar there as well, where as the internet continues to grow and it becomes more and more borderless, people are gonna to start to look and turn to Google to find companies who match with their values, but also provide the products or the services that they need. And there's gonna be less focus on where they're based, but are they providing the right type of value to that customer? So there is some silver linings in this, and there's some opportunities in different markets, in different sectors, but also within e-commerce as a whole. Sorry, just double checking that I got my transitions right, I did. Um, but looking at e-commerce, and now when I talk about e-commerce, I'm not just talking about the sale of goods, it also includes the online sale of services as well. So for all businesses, the size of this market is continuing to grow. We've maybe seen a slight slowdown when it comes to that, but it's still gonna be a $900, or $900 billion industry by 2026, which is absolutely phenomenal levels of opportunity for businesses. So within that, there's also a couple of key sectors and there's areas where businesses can try and look to focus, but really try to develop what they're doing and how they interact with customers in that. So not only are, is the entire ecosystem growing, we're still seeing some major growth in sectors such as retail, health and fitness, high tech, finance. And I think with the size of the overall e-commerce market, what we're seeing is that consumers are planning to shop more and more online and will continue to do this over the next coming years. So as a result of COVID, we changed our digital habits. We started to spend more time online, both in terms of purchasing, but in terms of how we work, how we live, how we learn. So people are spending more time online and that creates opportunities for these different markets and these different sectors to be able to capture that seeing how businesses pivoted throughout COVID gives us a little bit of an idea of what they can continue to do over the next coming years as we see this element of a reset. One of the, the big examples of companies during this is, or with the big uh, pieces of tech that came out was around buy now, pay later. Klarna, who are a Swedish company, have seen significant growth over the last couple of years, particularly in the US. So not only are they a success story of cross-border growth, but they're actually enabling businesses globally to grow cross-border as well and allowing customers to purchase easily and on their terms from different customer or from different businesses as well. So an excellent example of how cross-border is gonna to continue to grow and just develop in the next couple of years. 
And then in terms of markets and disrupting industries, what's really disrupting the markets is the shifting frontiers of regions. So APAC continues to be the fastest growing region in 2021, and we're expecting it again to be the fastest growing region in 2022. And within that as well, its GDP is expected to be the fastest growing over the next two decades. So you can see even here, looking at this graph, China, Indonesia, India are, are going to be in the top five markets globally. So for service businesses or tech businesses, being able to go in and launch your business with the young tech savvy markets like Indonesia and Philippines presents a massive opportunity for them. Or a little bit more maybe on the retail e-commerce side, you can tap into India's growing mobile revolution that's happening there where there's so much more access to people for internet. They're having different ways of being able to actually purchase online and it's becoming a lot more accessible for them. The Indian e-commerce market is expected to be 111 billion by 2026. So one ninth of the total global market. It's phenomenal opportunity there if you're able to go about it the right way. So looking at how businesses like yourselves can potentially do that. Well, the focus on digitalization is going to be essential. So being able to adapt your business so that you can target customers and reach customers in different ways, but also be flexible in terms of how you allow them to pay, how you allow them to move through your website and understand what your value proposition is as a business. Throughout COVID, we saw the digital acceleration. It accelerated 10 years in the space of six months where businesses just had to adapt. And that's going to continue and continue to grow. So this element of being online is going to be absolutely essential for the sustained growth of businesses, and particularly for UK businesses who are struggling uh, at the moment with this cost of inflation, consumer purchasing power, probably being a little bit lower in the market at the moment. Businesses can look outside and look at these new emerging opportunities from slightly further regions where it's going to be a lot more accessible to reach those customers in terms of delivery, in terms of anything to do with your online side as well. So there is real opportunity within that as well. And during this period, customers are going to turn to Google to find out who these are and find out what those businesses are. So back to the values piece as well. International also gives businesses a huge opportunity to diversify. We saw that companies who had a higher level of export business were less financially impacted throughout COVID. There was less of a hit because their, their risk was mitigated and spread out across multiple regions where you're not fully at risk to geopolitics or delayed uh, COVID policies where it's still zero COVID policy in the likes of China. So having that spread out risk is giving them an opportunity to continue to grow and to sustain themselves during those really tough periods. And I think again, with diversification comes the diversification of supply chain, the increased automation on that side as well, which is gonna make things a lot more accessible for businesses to be able to grow and reduce their own costs and hopefully become more profitable during that time. And profitability is the biggest topic of conversation that we're hearing at the moment. And probably one of the biggest factors for looking at international growth as well. The reason for that is as we move more towards the values rather than targeting geographies. If any of you run Google Ads accounts, it's very seldom that you actually target by demographic or by certain geographies and like little small areas within the UK. We're now starting to look for a customer profile of someone who interacts with your brand or engages with your product or has a real need for your service. So international and the reduction of borders that it provides for us is going to create huge opportunity for us there. Customers don't care about where they buy from. If your delivery proposition is as good as a local business, your website's translated so they can understand the services that you offer and what your value proposition really is, and you have customer service to be able to deal with people in those markets, people don't care where you're based. 97% of people in a survey didn't know that booking.com was based out of the Netherlands. It's because when you go onto their website, it doesn't feel like that. It feels like it's straight out of whatever market that you're living in because it's so well localized and so well set up for individual markets as well that they get and they are the biggest hotel 
booking platform in the world and one of the biggest customers with Google as well. Sorry, too early there. Um, so it's not the end of globalization. And where Google have actually looked to invest in the program that I work in, where we look to develop and create an ecosystem of digital marketing agencies and partners who can work with individual businesses so that they can focus on what they're really good at. And we support them with things like localization, with logistics, payments, and customer experience, as well as the marketing side to make sure that they're as profitable as possible and set up as well as possible. So it feels like they're a local business in international markets when they do launch there. So as part of our proposition, we now have consultants who advise across all of these areas and can also link you with partners who actually help with the execution of this. We also provide free translation for all of your advertising as well to support you in doing, moving internationally in a quick and cost efficient way as well for your business. So that's why we work with the likes of Hallam to give them access to the resource that we have so that they can work with the businesses and help them to grow globally. So as globalization ends and chaos seems to reign, the future of digital is going to be centered in these businesses who embrace what is happening at the moment, embrace the changes in technology, embrace the changes in borders and how we actually work with customers. And that will be the most powerful thing moving forward is the erosion of digital borders and companies embracing that. Thank you.